Hi guys, welcome to this video of the Advanced Data Structures playlist where we are going to discuss Flow Network. So in this video, we will start off with what is a flow network, then we will define the different properties of a flow and then we will look at residual capacity and residual graphs and then we will move towards the max flow problem where we will discuss the Ford Fulkerson algorithm. And then finally, we are going to spend the later part of this video in solving a max flow problem using the Ford Fulkerson algorithm. So let us start. So what is a flow network? A flow network is actually a graph in which each and every edge has a capacity. And in this graph, you have got a source vertex and a sink vertex or a source vertex and a destination vertex. So if you look at it, a flow network is actually a graph where each edge has a non-negative capacity C and there is a source vertex in this graph called as S and a sink vertex called as T. Okay? So here I have drawn a flow network. In this you can see that it looks like a graph and of course a graph with directed edges. You can uh, notice over here that each and every edge has an associated capacity or an associated number which is known as capacity like these are actually called as capacity of the edge, right? That means the maximum amount of material, any kind of material that can flow through this edge is known as its capacity, right? So as you can see over here, each and every edge has an associated capacity C and apart from that in this graph you can see that we have got a source denoted as S and a sink denoted as T. So we have got these two vertices. So this is basically a flow network, okay? Now, apart from this one number that is capacity which is associated to each and every edge in this flow network, there is another number that is associated to each and every edge and that number is known as the flow. So basically, when we say that from V1 to V3, the capacity is 2, that means that the maximum amount of material that can pass from V1 to V3 is 2 or the capacity of this road is actually 2. But what is the actual amount of material that is flowing through this path, through this edge? So that quantity is denoted using another number that is known as flow. Okay, I write, randomly write down the flow over here. I'll use this uh, red color. So in the red, I have written down the flow for each and every edge, right? So these, this two over here and this one over here is the flow for these particular edges, right? So basically flow determines the actual amount of material flowing through a particular edge. Whereas capacity determines the maximum amount of material that can flow through an edge. For, a, for an example, over here, for, from V3 to T, in this edge, the capacity is 3. That means the maximum amount of material that can flow through the, this edge is 3. Whereas, its flow value is 2. So that means the actual amount of material flowing through this edge right now is 2. Right? So now, in order to better understand flow, through a network, let us look at some properties that flow in any flow network satisfies. So let us look at these three properties that a flow in any particular flow network satisfies. So the first property is actually capacity constraint, right? That implies that for any particular edge in the flow network, the flow through it should always be less than or equal to the capacity of that edge. If I write it down, I can write it in this way. For any particular edge 
in our network, the flow through that edge should always be less than or equal to the capacity of that edge. So C denotes the capacity, where, whereas FUV denotes the flow of that edge. So for all the edges in our flow network, this capacity constraint is a property that needs to be followed. So even here you can see that here the capacity is 2 and the flow is actually equal to the capacity that is 2. Whereas over here the capacity is 3 whereas the flow is less than the capacity. In no, nowhere over here we will find out that the flow is actually greater than the capacity. Even in the real case scenario you will understand that it is not possible for the flow to be greater than the capacity, right? So this was the capacity constraint. Now talking about skew symmetry. So basically skew symmetry says that for each and every edge, if there is a path flowing in this direction with a particular flow, there will be another path in the opposite direction with a negative flow. So if I write it down, that implies for all the edges, if there is a flow from the vertex u, if let us call this as vertex u and this as vertex v, so if there is a flow from u to v, then there will be another flow in the opposite direction, in this opposite direction, which will be negative of that flow from u to v. And that flow, because it is in the opposite direction, so we will write it as fv, u and it will be a negative flow, right? So this is uh, the skew symmetry property that is satisfied by any flow in a flow network. Talking about flow conservation. Now to understand flow conservation, what you need to understand is that at any particular vertex in our flow network, the flow will not be accumulated or the material that is passing through the entire flow network is not going to be accumulated at any particular vertex. That implies that whatever is going into any vertex will also be coming out of that vertex. Right? So for example, if you look at this V1, in this V1, um, there are two flows going into it. Uh, one is of value 1 and another one is of value 1. So the total flow that is going into V1 is 2. And as you can see, the total flow coming out of V1 is 2. Right? Over here also if you look at V4. So at V4, the total flow that is going into it is 2. Whereas the total flow coming out of it is 1 plus 1, 2, right? So this flow conservation property has to be satisfied at each and every vertex in a flow network, except at the source and at the sink. Because as you can see over here, actually the flow coming out of source is total 1 plus 2, 3, but there is no flow going into the source. That is why it is known as the source, right? A vertex that has no incoming flows, right? Even in this case sink, you will find that there are no outgoing flows. That is why it is known as the sink. But over here at, at the source and the sink, you will find that this property of flow conservation does not hold. Rather it holds for each and every vertex except these two, right? Right? So this flow conservation property holds for every vertex except the source and the sink. Another thing that you should know in case of flow network is that uh, if you see over here, there is a cycle, right? Uh, from V2 to V4 and V4 to V3 and then back to V2. So V2, V4, so you see one cycle over here, V2, V4, V3, right? So this is a cycle. So basically some material is flowing into this cycle. So even if you subtract an equal amount from each and every edge, it will not make any difference. And all these properties will still hold if you subtract an equal amount of flow from each and every edge in this cycle. So suppose if I want to subtract, so right now as you can see, uh, if, if you look at this V2, the flow conservation is followed, right? Because 2 is coming into it and 1 is also coming into it, whereas 1 is going out over here, 2 is going out. So basically 3 is coming in to V2 and 3 is going out of V2. So suppose if we subtract 
an equal amount. So if I subtract one from each of these, so this will the flow of this will change from two to one, right? And the flow of this will change from one to zero. Flow of this also will change from one to zero. Uh, now if I again check, is the flow conservation property still holding right now? So again, if I look at V two, uh, the flow going into V two is two plus zero, so it is total two. And the flow going out of V two is actually uh, one plus one, two. So two is coming into V two and two is going out of V two. So flow conservation still holds. So after understanding what is a flow network and the different properties that a flow in a flow network holds, let us now move to the max flow problem in a flow network. Let us now move. Let us now understand a max flow problem in a flow network. So what is the aim of the max flow problem? So in the max flow problem, we want maximum flow to be pulled out of the source and be pushed into the sink without violating the three properties of flow that we saw just now. That is namely capacity constraint, skew symmetry and flow conservation. So we want these properties to be followed at the same time when we pass maximum flow into this flow network. So currently what is the flow that is flowing out of the source and going into the sink? So as you can see, the flow coming out of the source is 2 plus 1, right? It's 2 plus 1, right? So currently the flow is 2 plus 1, 3, okay? So the uh, question is, is this the maximum flow or there is some scope to increase the flow in this flow network. So sometimes it might happen that when you decrease the flow at any particular edge, at any one or two edges, your overall flow might increase and it might take you more closer to the maximum flow that you want to achieve in this max flow problem. So is there any edge in this particular flow network where we can decrease its flow and increase the overall flow. So suppose if I decrease the flow at this edge, V2 to V1, I decrease it from 1 to 0. Okay. Now because I have decreased one outgoing flow from V2, so I have to increase the other outgoing flow. So this will decrease this will increase from 1 to 2, right? In order to maintain the flow conservation at V2. Okay. And again, this will also increase from 1 to 2. So basically we just decreased the flow at a particular edge and that has led to increasing flows over here. But still, are we maintaining flow conservation at each and every edge? So if you look at this V1, the incoming flows at V1 is equal to 1 plus 0, 1. But the outgoing flow is actually equal to 2. So this is not uh, maintaining the flow conservation property. So what we can do over here is that we can actually increase this flow. So even if we increase it from 1 to 2, it is lesser than the capacity 3 of this edge, S to V1, right? So now if you look at this flow network, you will see that the flow that is coming out of the source and going into the sink is actually 4, right? 2 plus 2, 4 and 2 plus 2, 4. So earlier it was 3, now it has changed to 4, right? So basically, in this case, I knew already that if I decrease this edge, there might be a possibility of an increase in the overall flow of the network. But what if you have got around 10,000 edges in your flow network? In this case, how will you identify that this is the particular edge whose flow, if I decrease, will lead to an increase in the overall flow? It is extremely difficult to identify in such a big flow network, right? So how will you do that? So that is where residual graph comes into the picture. So you might already be knowing the meaning of residual. Residual means something that is left, right? So this residual graph will actually point out at those particular edges where we need to focus in order to increase our overall flow and take it closer to the maximum flow. So that finally we can achieve the maximum flow from source to sink. Right? So residual graph is going to help us in that. 
And in case of residual graph, we have got residual capacity, which is denoted using C F u comma b, and this value of this residual capacity is actually equal to capacity from u to b minus slope from u to b. Okay. Uh, so now we will draw a residual graph for this flow network over here. Okay, and then you will understand. That for each and every step, we are actually following this expression or this formula. Okay. So now we are going to draw a residual graph for this flow network over here. Okay. So let me just draw the vertices first. They will be same as we have them in our flow network. Okay. So these are the vertices. Now, as you can see over here, there is already a flow that is flowing from S to B one. That is, and the value of that flow is one. Right. So the residual flow at this part, or the left out flow that is possible at this part, is actually the capacity on this edge minus the flow at this edge. That means there is a scope of a flow of value two from S to B one because already one is flowing from S to B one, and we did capacity minus flow for this edge in order to determine the residual flow at this edge. Right. Apart from that, another thing that we need to do is that because there is a flow that is already flowing from S to B one, and the value of that flow is one, as you can see over here in this flow network. So, in order to actually, so in order to denote that flow in this graph, we need to draw an edge in the opposite direction. Right. So, basically, I'm following the skew symmetry property over here. So, we will draw an edge. In the opposite direction of the value one, right? Because there was a flow from S to B one, so I drew an edge in the opposite direction. Okay, and if you look at this edge, and uh, now if you look at this edge from S to B two, so basically there is a flow of two already flowing from S to B two. So there is no more amount of material that can flow because it is already flowing at its capacity, right? So we cannot draw an edge from S to B two. Rather, we can draw an edge in the opposite direction from B two to S in order to denote this flow that is already flowing, right? So in the opposite direction of the value two. Okay. Now, if you look at this edge B one, B two to B one, so there is a flow that is already flowing from B two to B one, and its value is one. So the residual flow that is possible is three minus one, that is two, in this direction. Right from B two to B one, and to denote this flow that is already flowing from B two to B one, we will draw it in the opposite direction from B one to B two, and its value is one. Okay. Now from B two to B four, the residual flow that is possible is one because two minus one, right? B two to B four, one, and to denote that flow that is already flowing from B two to B four, we draw it in the opposite direction from B four to B two, and its value is one. Okay. Now from B four to B three, there is nothing uh, flowing in this direction from B four to B three. So the extra flow or the residual flow that is possible from B four to B three is actually three because initially nothing is flowing in this direction, right? So the residual flow from B four to B three is three, and we don't draw an opposite edge over here because we don't have to denote any flow because nothing is actually flowing in this direction from B four to B three. So we don't have to draw any edge from B three to B four, right? Now, if we talk from B three to B two, again nothing is flowing in this direction. So the residual flow from B three to B two is actually one, right? Because the capacity is one, so the residual flow will be actually equal to capacity in this case where nothing is flowing, right? Now from B one to B three, basically it is flowing at its capacity, so. No residual flow is possible in this direction from B one to B three, but we will draw a flow in the opposite direction using the skew symmetry property. So we will draw from B three to B one, B three to B one, and the value is two. And from B three to T, the residual flow that is possible is three minus two, that is one. Okay, and in the opposite direction, we will denote this flow that is already flowing with two. From B four to T, residual flow that is possible is one. In the opposite direction, one. Right? 
So this is our residual graph. I hope I have covered uh, each and every edge over here. So in this case, I have taken my initial graph. So the flow of this graph, as you can see, is 2 plus 1, 3 itself. Right? So earlier what I did was, I decreased the value of flow at this edge from 1 to 0. And then I made all the different changes so that each and every vertice follows the flow conservation property. And finally, I made the flow to 4. Right? But then we saw that it is very difficult to determine such kind of edge in a very big flow network. So in that case, we use this residual graph. So if, if there is a path possible from the source to the sink in the residual graph, that means there is a scope of increase in the, map, in the flow or the overall flow of our flow network. And if such kind of path is not possible from the source to the sink, any path is not possible from source to sink in a residual graph, there is no scope of increase in the flow. And that flow that we already have will be called as our maximum flow, right? So here I cannot call flow of 3 as maximum flow. Why? Because if I look at my residual graph, I can see that if I go from S to V1, from S to V1, and then if I go to V2, and then if I go to V4, from V2 to V4, and then to T, there is such kind of path possible, right? And such kind of path from source to sink in a residual graph is actually known as an augmenting path. So this path that I have written over here is an augmenting path uh, which we derive out of a residual graph, okay? So if any augmenting path exists in our residual graph, then there is a scope of increase in the flow of our flow network, okay? So now if I also write down the flows on these edges, so from S to V1, the flow is 2. From V1 to V2, the flow is 1. From V2 to V4, it is 1. From V4 to T, it is 1. So the flow of the material that is possible or the maximum flow that is possible from across this entire path is actually the minimum of all these flows, right? And the minimum of all these flows, the minimum of 2, 1, 1, 1 is actually 1. And this 1 that I got over here will actually determine the extra flow that is possible in the flow that we already have. And this 1 is also known as the bottleneck capacity, okay? It is also known as the bottleneck capacity, right? So we learned that an augmenting path is a path in our residual graph from source to the sink and bottleneck capacity is the minimum out of all the flows in the augmenting path. So if because I have got an augmenting path with a bottleneck capacity of 1, so that means there is a scope of increase of 1 in my flow. So that means my flow can be 4, right? So how I will make it 4 in the flow network? We will talk about it later when we discuss the 4 Ferguson algorithm. But right now I can say that this flow, this flow of 3 that I had earlier was not the maximum flow. And here we are doing the maximum flow problem. So again, is 4 the maximum flow? So for that, we actually need to modify our flow network by including this augmenting path or including this additional flow into our flow network. And out of that, we need to de derive another residual graph that will be different from this residual graph because that residual graph will actually be derived after we include this flow into our already existing flow, right? So now we have already learned residual graph, residual capacity, bottleneck capacity and augmenting path. So now it's high time that we start the Ford Fulkerson algorithm in order to solve the maximum flow problem. So now let us look at the Ford Fulkerson algorithm in order to solve the maximum flow problem. So what are the steps of this algorithm? So the first step is that we need to initialize our overall flow with 0, okay? 
That means initially, so we are looking at this flow network. So initially the flow in this flow network or the overall flow in this flow network is zero. So I have written down the capacities for each and every edge over here. You should not confuse them with the flows. So all these green ones are actually the capacity of each and every edge. So the first step is to initialize the overall flow with the value zero. The second step is that we need to look at the residual graph. And in the residual graph, if we find an augmenting path, so the bottleneck capacity across this augmenting path, we will add that a bottleneck capacity to our overall flow. Or basically, as you can see in this step, while augmenting path P exists in our residual graph, we will add the flow of P, you can also call this as bottleneck capacity. We will add this flow of P or that we will add bottleneck capacity to our overall flow. So we will keep on adding it, right, until an augmenting path exists in our residual graph. And finally, we will return this overall flow and this will actually be the maximum flow that is possible across this flow network. Okay? So let us try to find out the maximum flow for this flow network that I have drawn over here. Now if you look at this graph, this is basically our flow network graph, right? At the same time, this is also our residual graph. Why am I calling the same thing as my residual graph? Because initially, the flow at each and every edge is actually zero, right? So basically, it is not written, but implicitly it implies this is zero, this is zero, zero, zero. So basically, this is also my residual graph in the initial case, right? This is also my residual graph, right? So now, as we say, in the second step, we need to find an augmenting path. If an augmenting path exists in this residual graph, that means there is a scope of increase in our overall flow, which is initially zero. Okay? So let us see if an augmenting path is possible in this case or not. So, uh, so let me just remove these zeros. So I can see that many paths are possible. But uh, let me take the first augmenting path from source to sink. So I can see one from S to V2, V2 to V4 and V4 to T. So the augmenting path 1 is actually equal to S to V2, V2 to V4 and V4 to T. Okay. And if I write down the residual flows as this is also a residual graph in the initial case. So the flows, so the flows are 12, 11 and 4. So in this case our bottleneck capacity is or the minimum amount of all these is 4, right? So basically this is what we are going to add in our overall flow in the second step, right? So we found an augmenting path and the bottleneck capacity is something we are going to add in our overall flow. So the bottleneck capacity is 4, right? So our overall flow is 4, okay? So now when we add this flow into our flow network, so our flow network is going to change, right? So how our flow network will change? So we also have to denote these flows in this flow network. So the flow over here is basically 4, right? So I can draw from S to V to 4, 4 and again 4, okay? But after drawing this flow over here in this augmenting path, my I have a different residual graph, right? Because as you can see, this path has changed or the flow across this path has changed. So I get a different residual graph out of this flow network. So let me draw that residual graph over here. So this will not remain our residual graph. We will get a new residual graph for this flow network. So I have already shown you how to draw a residual graph out of a flow network. Let us do it once again. So from S to V1 there is no change. So it will remain 11. Even from V1 to V3 no change. So the residual capacity is 12. From V3 to V T it is 19. From V2 to V1 also again 
this was not in, this edge was not included in our augmenting path, so it will remain as one. From S to V2, so basically the residual capacity from S to V2 is 12 minus 4 because initially 4 is already flowing. So 12 minus 4 is the residual capacity, that is 8. Okay, and again we will draw an opposite edge to denote this initial flow of 4, right? In the similar way. From V2 to V4, the residual capacity is capacity minus flow, that is 11 minus 4, 7, and in opposite direction we will draw 4. And from V4 to T, the residual capacity is 0, right? Because now no more extra flow is possible in this direction because uh, it is flowing at its capacity of 4, right? So in this direction there will be no edge from V4 to T. But to denote that already existing flow, we will draw an edge in the opposite direction with the value of 4. And again in this direction it will remain same, from V4 to 3 it will be 7. Okay? So this is my residual graph. Now again I check in this new residual graph that if an augmenting path is existing in this graph or not. That means, is there a path from S to T? So if I look at this residual graph, I can see a path from S to V1 to V3 to T. Yes, so this is another augmenting path that I found out. So let me draw that augmenting path. We'll call it as augmenting path 2. So it is from S to V1 to V3 to T. Okay. And if I write down the residual capacities, they are 11, 12, from V3 to T it is 19. Okay, now if I talk about the bottleneck capacity or the minimum capacity out of uh, all these residual capacities, it, it is basically 11, right? The minimum is 11. So I'll add this bottleneck capacity to my overall flow. So again, I'll add plus 11 over here and this will become 15. So again, I'm not sure if 15 is my maximum flow across this flow network. I will be sure when this Y condition will become false, okay? So this particular flow, we need to denote it in our flow network, okay? So let me denote it in my flow network. So initially in this path, there was no flow, but now there is a flow of 11 from S to V1, from, of 11 from V1 to V3 of the bottleneck capacity value, and again of 11 from V3 to T. Okay, and because of this flow or because of this new augmenting path, we will have a new residual graph. This is not the uh, residual graph corresponding to this flow network. We will get a new one, right? Because even if you see over here, from S to V1, the residual capacity, this residual graph, it is showing it as 11. But here if you see that this uh, edge is actually flowing at its capacity. That means the residual capacity in this direction should be 0, right? Because already a, a value of 11 is flowing through this edge and its capacity is also 11. So this is not the residual graph corresponding to this flow network. Let me draw another residual graph that will correspond to this flow network after we add this flow of augmenting path 2, okay? So we have got these vertices. And from S to V1, the residual capacity will be capacity minus flow, that is 0. And to denote this already existing flow, we will draw an edge in the opposite direction. Okay. And from V1 to V3, the residual capacity is 1, that is 12 minus 11. In the opposite direction, 11. And the residual capacity from V3 to T is 19 minus 11, that is 8. And the rest of the things will remain same as they were in the previous residual graph. Okay. So, this is the new residual graph that we have got after we included this flow of augmenting path 2. So again we are at this step 2 and again we are checking the Y condition. If the augmenting path P exists in this new residual graph, then we will add the flow of that augmenting path to our overall flow. If it does not exist, then we will return this overall flow as the maximum flow. So let us check. So is there a path from S to P? So from S to V2, V2 to V4, V4 to V3 and V3 to T. So yes, there is another augmenting path from S to V2, V2 to V4, V4 to V3 and V3 to T. So let us write it down 
as our augmenting part 3 and the residual capacities across um, on all the edges across these paths are 8, 7, from V4 to V3, 7, from V3 to T, it is 8. Okay. So the bottleneck capacity is the minimum value. You can call it this 7 or this 7, but the value of that is 7. Right? So again, there will be an addition in our overall flow, and this value will change from 15 to 22. Okay? So now we have to include this flow in the augmenting part 3, this flow of value 7 into our flow network. Okay? So let us include it. So across this path, we are adding an additional flow. So there was already an existing flow from S to V2 of the value 4, but we are adding an additional flow of 7. Okay? So 4 plus 7, 11. Okay? Even in this case, we are adding an additional flow of 7, so from 4 it changes to 4 plus 7, 11. Then we are moving from V4 to V3. Initially flow across this direction was 0, so now we are making it 7. And from V3 to T, initially it was 11, so again we are adding an additional flow of 7, so 11 plus 7 is equal to 18. So now we have got this flow network. And this residual graph does not correspond to this flow network but it corresponds to the previous flow network that we had before we included operating path 3. So now let us draw the new residual graph. So let me draw that new residual graph over here, over here itself. So we went across this path from S to V2. Okay. So from S to V2. Uh, now we can have, now the residual capacity from S to V2 is 12 minus 11, that is 1, and we will draw an edge of 11 in the opposite direction to denote the already existing flow. From V2 to V4, the residual capacity in this direction is 0, so we will just draw an opposite edge of 11. Then from V4 to V3, again the residual capacity is 7 minus 7, 0. So we draw an opposite edge of 7. From V3 to T, the residual capacity is 19 minus 18, that is 1. And we draw an opposite edge of 18. Okay. Then the rest of the things will remain same because there was no change in them because the augmenting path was only across these paths. Okay. So the rest of the things will remain same as they were in the earlier residual graph. So I copy that as it is. So now again I am at my step 2. And I look at this new residual graph and I check if an augmenting path exists in this residual graph or not. So I don't even need this edge because the flow at this edge is zero. Okay, so I will remove it from both the places. So now we, we can be sure that there is no path possible across this direction because there is just an incoming edge from V1. But if you look at this direction from S to V2, so from V2 we can only go to V1, from V1 to V3. Then from V3 to T. Yes, we have got an augmenting path from S to V2, V2 to V1, V1 to V3, and V3 to T. So let us call it as an augmenting path 4. Okay, this is the fourth augmenting path. So now if you look at the residual capacity from S to V2, it is 1. From V2 to V1, it also it is 1. V1 to V3, it is 1. From V3 to T, it is 1. So no doubt about it. The bottleneck capacity in this case is 1 because the minimum of all of these, of all 1s is 1, right? So to include this augmenting path 4 or to include the flow of augmenting path 4 in our flow network, let us do it. So from S to V2, the flow will change from 11, there will be an additional 1 value of bottleneck capacity, so it will change from 11 to 12. From V2 to V1, initially the flow was 0, as you can see over here, so it changes to 1. So again from V1 to V3, it was initially 11, so we add the bottleneck capacity to it, so it changes from 11 to 12. And from V3 to T, it changes from 18 to 19, so I will write this again, it changes from 18 to 19, and the capacity was also 19, okay, fine. So, this is the new flow network. Now corresponding to this flow network, this is not the residual graph, but we need to draw another residual graph. 
So I will remove this old residual graph. At the same time, we also need to add this flow or this bottleneck capacity of 1 to our overall flow. So this will change from 22 to 23. Because until now we have got 1, 2, 3, 4 operating paths. Yes, 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? So we have kept on adding the uh, bottleneck capacity to the overall flow and currently we have the value as 23. Okay? So let me draw the residual graph corresponding to this flow network. So from, for S to V1, there is no residual capacity. So there will be no edge from S to V1, just an opposite edge of 11. And from S to V2, again the residual capacity is 0 because 12 minus 12. So there will just be an opposite edge that is from V2 to S and its value will be 12. Same in the case of V1 to V3. For V2 to V1, the residual capacity is 1 minus 1, 0. So we will draw V1 to V2. Okay. And again for V4 to V2, there will be an opposite edge of 11. From V4 to V3, again the residual capacity is 0. So we will draw it as 7 over here. 4. So as we can see, the residual capacity at each and every edge seems to be 0. It is 0. So again, let us try to find if an orbiting path P exists in this new residual graph. So if you look at this new residual graph, you will see that there are just incoming edges at the source. There are no outgoing edges from the source. So there is no possibility of an orbiting path in this residual graph, right? So in this case, the Y condition fails and we go to the third step where we return the overall flow. And this overall flow is actually also our maximum flow, right? So the fourth Fulkerson algorithm ensures that when it returns this overall flow, after this Y condition fails, that return value is actually our maximum flow, okay? So this was our fourth Fulkerson algorithm in which we initialized our overall flow in the initial step with zero and then we checked for each and every new residual graph that we got that is there an augmenting path existing in that residual graph? If an augmenting path is existing in the residual graph, then we took the bottleneck capacities for each and every of those augmenting paths and we added them to the overall flow, right? And when this while condition failed, at that time we returned this overall flow. And guess what? This overall flow is actually also the maximum flow across this flow network. Okay? So this was all about the Fort Fulkerson algorithm. So that's all for this video. So in this video, we learned what are flow networks we defined the different properties of flow and then we saw what is a residual graph, what are augmenting paths and what is the bottleneck capacity. And then we saw the aim of our maximum flow problem and then we uh, looked at the Fort Fulkerson algorithm and finally we solved this flow network for the maximum flow problem using the Fort Fulkerson algorithm. So that's all for this video. If you like this video, please share it as much as possible with all your friends and classmates. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more such content.